thank you for having me today. This is a great turnout. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to be in Kansas. So I haven't been here that long, so I may have to ask some of you guys what are fun things to do around Kansas, around Manhattan, all the good places to look at things on Congress, too, because I've only been here um, since about the end of August. So I started with Neon in July. Um, I finished up my graduate degree. Um, I defended in February and finished that up in June, so I'm fairly a new graduate, too, um, of, of that. From where? From where? Yes, from the University of Montana in Missoula, Montana. So I was out in Montana for the past 10 years prior to this, uh, both working and then working perpetually on my PhD. <laughs> I think that's how it kind of goes. Um, in that time, though, I uh, yeah just developed a really intense love for ecology, which is kind of what brought me to NEON in the first place, too, is just that um, it's a really, really neat, new organization um, that has really, really um, amazing goals um, about what we're trying to accomplish and what we're going to do in the future, too. So that was kind of what brought me to NEON. My background is more of a community ecologist, so I uh, dealt with um, kind of the effects of uh, invasion, plant invasion specifically, on native communities. Um, and I did that in Montana grasslands. So that's kind of what um, really drove me to apply for the position here in Kansas is just because of your guys' beautiful, beautiful grasslands that you have here. Um, I, contrary to some people's belief, Montana is kind of a desert. Um, so I'm very impressed by uh, the height of the grasses around here on Kansas and then also our work that we do over at the University of Kansas State Station too. Um, it just impresses me because our grasses, um, if on a good day, they might be this tall. And that's our, our big ones. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's pretty cool to be here. Um, and, and thanks to Jill for inviting me and all of you guys for letting me talk to you today. <clears throat> all right, so I just want to kind of give you just a general outline of what I'm going to talk with you guys about today. So I, want to, I know that there's probably varied knowledge of NEON um, in this group here. So I first want to kind of go through a little bit about um, what is NEON. So how did it begin? Um, how has it progressed to date? Um, and then where we're going in the future. Yeah. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about what um, our sampling strategy is and what kind of data we'll be collecting. Um, because you guys are going to be out there um, on the prairie and you're going to see our plots and be like, okay, what the heck is Neon doing out here? Um, so this might give you at least a better idea of what we're going to start doing this summer and what we'll be continuing to progress into doing um, in the future. Both, um, so this coming summer we'll be starting our terrestrial sampling, um, getting very, um, just a little bit into our aquatic sampling on Kings Creek, um, and then we're going to be starting to get into our atmospheric and airborne sampling too. Um, so kind of I'm going to go through each of those areas in a little bit more detail, um, just to kind of give you guys a better idea about that. Um, if you do have questions during the presentation, feel free to raise your hands and ask me, especially if you need to forget by the end of the presentation, that's me, I'm just like, if I don't write it down, I won't remember it by the time we're done. So feel free to interrupt me. Um, or else I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions at the end, too. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the timeline of the project, so um, where we've come from, where we're going, and where we're going to be in the future. This is a very um, big project. Um, starting in 2017, we'll be collecting data for 30 years, so up through 2046. Um, so it's a pretty impressive timeline we have. Um, then I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're doing here in the Prairie Peninsula domain um, and our field sites here in Kansas. So all of our field sites are located um, in Kansas, and actually in pretty close proximity to, um, to my town, too. Um, and then lastly, talk a little bit about Project Budverse, which from talking to a few people um, out at our table um, in the, I guess, I don't know if you call it the lobby? <laughs> that out there. We'll call that out there. <laughs> okay, so, well, it sounds like there's um, some people who actually know quite a bit about Project Budverse. So um, I'm kind of going to tell a little bit about that and then encourage you guys to become involved in it, too. It's a, it's a super neat citizen science. Okay, so what the heck is NEON? Well, NEON itself is a large science facility that is fully funded by the National Science Foundation. So we don't have any other funding partners um, at all. We are entirely funded by uh, the federal government, specifically the National Science Foundation. Now, it's a continental scale observatory, so we're observing uh, and collecting our data um, to be used at a continental scale. Now, this is different from, um, you know, if I'm going out and doing research here at CONSA, for instance, and I'm doing a bunch of line transfer and sampling plants on those line transects. That gives me a really good idea about what's going on here on Kanza, maybe even specifically in this particular burn regime, for instance. But what we're, the goal of what we're doing is we want to collect data that we can extrapolate across the continent. So we want to know what's going on in the Prairie Peninsula domain and how that differs from the northern grasslands, for instance, in North Dakota. 
Okay, so that's kind of the larger goal of this. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to collect and provide data on both the drivers and also the responses of ecological change. So we really want to get at these kind of ideas of why are our why is the ecology changing out there, or why is it, or is it is it changing or is it not? Um, the observatory itself serves as an experimental infrastructure or a backbone for research and experiments. So the infrastructure part is kind of the big um, thing that we're doing with this observatory because we weren't able to do this um, prior to um, to Neon's development because we just didn't have the facilities to do this. You guys see the towers out there. Those didn't exist before, so we couldn't collect the data that we'll be collecting on those towers without the towers being present. Um, and then lastly, we're also going to be developing and providing educational resources to really engage communities. So for instance, the community of Manhattan, the community of Concert Prairie, um, in working with this scientific data. Um, so I know that Jill and I have talked about, you know, maybe in the future there could be something that um, you docents could be designing for um, help uh, with your program too. You know, maybe there's some data that NEON can contribute and um, vice versa. So we really, um, that's kind of a big thing about our project too, is we really want to engage the community and make you guys a part of this because um, we all are the observers. All right, so here's the general product timeline. Um, so um, from the beginning, um, through its concept and design stage, so we started in the early 2000s, um, officially in 2004. Um, and then currently right now, we're in our construction phase, where it's sites built out from 2012 to 2017. Um, by 2017, all of our facilities, all of our sites should be built and constructed. And then we'll move into um, our data collection even though we will be collecting some data while things are getting built to you. But all of our sites should be fully functional by that time, and then we'll be collecting data for 30 years. So it's a, it's a pretty big project. Okay, so in the beginning. So where did this whole National Ecological Observatory Network start from? Well, back in 2001, there was a committee that was formed by the National Research Council, and they identified what they call these grand challenges in the environmental sciences. I don't expect you guys to read these, um, but look at the bold words if you want. Um, the big idea of this is that they said, hey, you know what, these are areas we really need to um, look into because um, it's areas that are important for environmental research. Okay, fast forward a couple of years, and NEON starts being a little bit bigger topic. Specifically within the National Research Council, they formed a committee that was identifying what they deemed to be the grand challenge in environmental biology. It was based largely on that other um, uh, committee that was formed in 2001, but this is things that they said, okay, these are the really big things. And this is what, uh, these grand challenges were what were used to form the goals of the observatory network. Um, and what they said, how they picked specifically what these grand challenges would be is because they said that these are specific areas that really need a high priority, both for ecological and environmental. So they really targeted and said, hey, these are the areas that, that we need to get to now um, so that we can observe them in the long term. Uh, and I think the biggest difference between um, you know, things that have been done prior and the National Observatory Network is that this is done more at a regional, so at our Prairie uh, Peninsula domain level, and then also at this continental scale. It was something that we just it just wasn't possible. I think the biggest thing that came out of this kind of um, concept um, committee that they were doing in 2003 was that they said, hey, you know what, National Science Foundation, yes, this is a really good idea. Um, the concept of the National Observatory Network is good. We formulated why it should exist, uh, what we're going to look at, and that it should be at this regional and continental scale. But what they really identified was that it was currently impossible based on what kind of infrastructure or what kind of setup we and they said, if you want to get this rolling, we're going to need to have funding for this um, to set up this infrastructure. So that was the big thing that happened in 2003. Fast forward to 2011, so we're at the end of our concept and design stage, and NEON um, has progressed extensively. So now we have our science strategy, which is a fairly large document um, that just kind of outlines the goals of NEON, what NEON is about, and how we're going to get this done. Um, I think the big thing that I want to take out of the science strategy is that they said that the National Ecological Observatory Network is a bold effort to expand horizons in the science of large scale ecology. So remember, we're at this continental and regional scale. It's a big deal. And we're building on recent, recent progress in many fields. So prior to this, there wasn't as much science being done um, at this kind of scale. It's a fairly new thing, probably I say within the last couple decades. 
Um, and so because of the recent developments in other people's science, we were able to um, then uh, embark on the same, the same kind of thing. Okay, so the NEON's goal is also to improve our understanding and forecasting of ecological change on continental scales. So if you don't get anything else from the, my little talk today, it's that we're kind of doing big picture stuff. We're at the regional and we're at the continental scale. And that's the big thing that um, NEON is enabling us to do that wasn't, um, we weren't able to do in the past. All right, so how did we progress then from, you know, okay, yeah, we have these grand challenges. These are things that we really need to do um, to now we have an observatory that is gonna collect data and that is gonna produce products that are available to everyone. Well, NEON identified these grand challenges, like I mentioned, that are this high priority for environmental and ecological research. And NEON science itself is kind of guided by these grand challenges. So we look at the causes of change, or potential causes of change. So climate change, land use changes, um, invasive species. Those are kind of what we think is, okay, these seem to be the primary drivers of ecological change. But additionally, also looking at the responses to change. So things like how does biogeochemistry or biodiversity, ecohydrology, or the presence or absence um, or prevalence of infectious disease also change. So both the causes and the responses. <clears throat> and then what this did is this allowed um, us to formulate, okay, what are our key questions that we as the, as the National Ecological Observatory Network want to address. And what we wanted to address, our first three questions are just what are the impacts of those causes of change? So how does climate change? How does land use? And how does it affect um, invasive species? What are their impacts at a continental scale? Then the fourth question is just, well, how do these things potentially interact? So how does climate change interact with land use changes? Or how does, if on a particular invasive species come in, how does that re um, interact with the other two? Um, at, at the full factorial scale of that. Um, and then lastly, thinking more about um, kind of these, the biogeochemistry, the biodiversity, ecohydrology stuff. So how does the transport and the mobility of both energy, so thinking about like our carbon cycle, for instance, matter and also organisms moving around, affect continental mental scale ecology? And I don't want you to look at what these all are, but I just want to say that we are collecting a lot of data right now. <laughs> And I'm going, to, I'm going to talk a little bit more later about some of the specific stuff. But what I want you to get out of this slide is that we have these questions that are guided by the grand challenges, and then that is how we figured out what kind of data we're going to collect. And then who is this data available to? Well, it's widely available and it's free to, to a lot of different entities. So scientists can use this data. Educators can use this data. Like I was mentioning, um, if Jill wanted to design a dose and activity, you guys could do that with NEON data that is widely and freely available. Students can use this. So thinking about college undergraduates, you know, ecology <laughs> professors could use this to design some killer lab activities. Um, the public can use it. Decision makers, policy makers can use NEON data to guide um, much better and informed decisions. <clears throat> okay, so what do we look like? So we are a continental scale design, like I mentioned. We have what we call um, eco domains that are situated all throughout the United States, including Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and Alaska. And how we, you kind of look at this and you're like, whoa, there's lots of borders going everywhere. I don't have the states overlaid with this. So just kind of think about where those are too. Um, but what we did is they modeled based on climate and vegetation types, which areas are the most similar. So if you can think about it, within each of these um, different domains, we call them, so six, seven, eight, nine, one through 20, pretty much, um, that the vegetation and climate is much more similar within a domain than it is outside the domain. So that's so that we're sampling within a particular domain, you can think about, okay, at the regional scale, so at the Prairie Peninsula scale, this is what's going on. And then we can say, okay, well, how does this differ between the Northern Plains or the Great Lakes or the Ozarks complex? So that's kind of where we're going with that. Um, we're gonna have a total of 106 sites that are built across these 20 domains. Um, within each domain, we're going to have three terrestrial sites, mostly, um, three aquatic sites. And the terrestrial sites will have towers on them, like you guys see here on Kanza, um, they'll like, which have atmospheric sensors on them, they'll have soil pits, um, they'll have organismal sampling. We'll have 60 aquatic sites that also have sensors, and we'll also do organismal sampling, um, which I'll detail a little bit more when I go into each of the sampling designs. And then we'll also have 10 strion sites, which is called an abbreviation 
uh, for the screen observatory effort. It's an experiment um, looking at nutrient input and also predator exposure. Okay, so what exactly are we going to be sampling up here? Pretty much, if you had a favorite organism, we're about going to probably be sampling it because we're doing some really, really wide spread sampling. So our terrestrial observation system, uh, and that's just all of our terrestrial so you can think about if we're doing it on the ground, it's terrestrial. And what we're going to be doing with this is we're going to collect data on biogeochemical cycles, infectious diseases, so for instance, the presence of Lyme's disease in ticks, or West Nile virus in mosquitoes, a Morhanta virus in deer mice. And then also, we'll be doing this, all of these kind of samplings, you can see kind of what we're going to be doing within each taxon group. Um, that the focal taxa characterize the local patterns within this, um, and they also look at the dynamics within each of them, but then also look at potential linkages between the different groups. Um, and the way that we chose specifically what tax we'll be looking at, um, so for instance, the deer mouse is I think a great example of this because it's widespread um, through many, many of our domains. So we can look at, okay, how are deer mouse mice populations being um, are different between the different domains? How are they being affected by certain other drivers? Um, and <coughs> why this could potentially be happening. So that's a potential question that someone could look at. Question. Yeah, please do. Uh, it must take an army of people to collect and analyze all this data. How many people are going to hire? Yeah, so it takes an army, and it also takes um, <coughs> strategic army, I guess we could say. So we don't, we, unfortunately, we can't hire a ton of people. But what we will be doing is, so in, in Kansas itself, uh, and then you can kind of think about how this can extrapolate up to North America or the United States, um, we're going to have seven full-time staff members, counting myself. Um, we're going to have a mammologist, a botanist, um, two people who will be working on our towers, and then two people who will be specializing in aquatics. So those are going to be our full-time staff. We're going to have upwards of 20 seasonal staff members who will be coming on. And I think what's when I say seasonal, some people think, oh, they're going to be doing three months of work. They're going to be hired on for about nine months of work. Um, in some domains, ten months of work. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty extensive. Um, but at that same level, we have to really prioritize our sampling, um, which is kind of what we're doing right now in this whole design phase. Um, because in some, so there's some domains that have been sampling for one to two seasons already. We have not sampled at all here. And we've realized that our goals were really, really long. <laughs> that to collect all the data that we really you know, want to collect and that we think would be really good for us to you know, really get a feel for what's going on in the landscape, we can't do it with the budgeting that we have, of course. It's always budgeting. Um, so we're going to try to collect as much as we can um, in the time that we have. I urge with terrestrial, just to kind of give you an idea of like how we're going to be out there on the landscape. So when you guys see some things out there here on Kanza, um, as far as our plot bar <coughs> go, we will be having in the non grave areas um, metal conduit posts. So if you see metal conduit posts out there that are painted uh, fluorescent pink, that is neon. We are we are fluorescent pink. We are a staff of three women so far, and we'll see if the men who I'm bringing on soon uh, agree with our fluorescent pink. But um, so <coughs> in the out, out of the grazed areas, that's what our markers will look like. Within the grazed areas, we're going to be having monument markers, um, which are survey markers for any of you who are with surveying that will be pounded into the ground where possible, um, and then have a small disc on the top that will have neon imprinted onto it, mainly so that we don't um, hurt any of the cows or the and of course, also so that our markers don't burn up when the burns happen. So that was um, a, an ongoing challenge as far as thinking about that. But we can think here is so this, think of this as Kanza here. We could think of the darker green as maybe our forested areas and the lighter green as the grassland areas. So we have um, larger bird, bird grids that are set both in multiple habitat types. And then nested within those bird grids, we have mammal trapping grids, tick transects, um, and biodiversity plots and soil. So we try to co-locate these and see if there's any type of interactions between, uh, let's say, small mammals and birds, um, based on you know what's the plant community going on there. So this is kind of our terrestrial platform. This here is an example of our tower, and I'm going to talk about that just in a second here. All right, so our aquatic sampling here in Kanza, we're going to be present on Kings Creek, and then if you guys are familiar with McDowell Creek too, which is just kind of on the other side of the road over there, so those are our two aquatic sites. Um, within um, a strain, we're going to be doing sensor measurements. Um, we're also going to be having a micrometeorology station. 
and then also had numerous groundwater wells on both sides um, of the creek um, just to get some measurements of the groundwater. We'll also be doing field sampling too um, at the stream, uh, looking at water chemistry, isotope analysis, we'll be looking at a lot of biological diversity components, so uh, what the microbes are doing, what types of algae are present, aquatic plants, invertebrates, and even fish. And I have to ask, you guys probably know better than me, are there fish present in Kings Creek? Yes. Okay, thank you. I figured there was, but I had no idea. So, um, also, morphology of the river itself. So, are we mapping what the river looks like? Um, we're looking at the canopy. Um, so, what plants are present over the over the creek? And then again, this strion experiment, which is an experiment in nutrient addition and predator exclusion. I'll show you a diagram here and a couple of slides about the strion experiment. Okay, so this is kind of a general. Um, outline of what our aquatic sampling do. So you can think this is just a small reach on King Street, for instance. So I think the main things to notice here are that we're going to have two aquatic sensors, that's these gray, um, uh, one, two, six hexagon, I think that's right, gray AIs, we'll go with that, um, on the stream, that there's one upstream and one downstream. And those ones will be doing um, a lot of instrument measurements. We'll also be doing a lot of biological sampling, so looking at the algae, aquatic plants, bryophytes within the stream. We'll have these groundwater wells, which are located um, on either side of the stream, and then our that's our micrometeorology station that will be taking a lot of climate data. So, for instance, what's the wind speed? What's the humidity? What's the temperature going on um, right there um, at King's Creek? And then here's the strand experiment. This will be going on at McDowell Creek, so not here on King's Creek. And what you can see here, the main things I want you to see is that upstream we have a control reach. And then downstream, we have a treatment reach. And within this, the main things that we'll be looking at are what are the effects of adding nutrients to a creek um, on all of those biological processes, biological and um, uh, instrument processes going on. And then also, how does this affect um, with predator exclusion? So we have these small little um, boxes, which you can see here, where we're excluding all large predators. Think of a predator, it could be fish, it could be large insects. Um, things of that. So how is algae within there, smaller invertebrates, how is that affected both by um, having predators excluded and then how is that also affected by <coughs> I think the best thing that I can say as far as what this would be um, mimicking potentially, um, the, the particles are still kind of in, in flux right now, um, are that, you know, for instance, runoff from agricultural fields that have been heavily produced. That'd be an example. Okay, so, the, so within the uh, terrestrial instrument sampling, so this is our towers. We're going to be doing both atmospheric measurements, so that these stuff will be going on on the tower, and then also soil measurements. So I'll show you a picture here. You guys, if you've been looking at the towers at all, you'll notice that there's the giant tower itself, and then there is a large array that seems to be going off in one direction. That's our soil array, and on and what we do is we're sampling the soil um, temperature, moisture, the presence of carbon dioxide, and then looking also at root growth <coughs> and phenology when the roots <coughs> are grown um, based on varying distances from the tower. Uh, the actual measurements that we take on the tower are the key climate inputs, uh, bioclimatic variables, some of the chemical climate inputs you can think of again like the carbon cycle. Um, or I guess I'm talking about carbon cycle. Um, water and energy balance, so precipitation coming in, evapotranspiration going out, how much light is coming down, how intense the light is, um, any kind of, um, yeah, that's about it for that. Um, but this is gonna be um, a very um, intense sampling. Uh, and the main goal of this is that we're gonna be trying to figure out what's going on, how is the stuff that we're making on the tower, and how is that related to um, what is going on in the soil, and then also some of our uh, biological Here, if we look here, you can see this is where the tower is. And the way the towers are situated, so here's the tower, and here's that soil array that I was saying. So out here is where we do all of our soil sampling. <laughs> so wherever the predominant wind is coming in, we set the soil array that goes along that same direction. We also then have um, productivity plots where we're looking at plants um, and how plant productivity differs. And the idea with this is where that, okay, let's say for instance we're measuring nitrogen, both in the atmosphere and in the soil, how is that then potentially related to plant productivity? Or you can think about CO2 in the same area. And there, that is what a fully outfitted tower will look like. Um, so we are going to be deploying our towers here in March, April, May. Um, we think it's probably going to be closer to March right now. 
as far as this goes, um, but that is what it will look like when it's fully automated. Um, so, so stay tuned, just soon enough we'll be getting that, that up, up and running. Okay, so the last um, sampling platform that we have is airborne observations. So this is where we fly a plane <coughs> here with some very um, high um, technology, a spectrometer and a LIDAR, which um, Sam, who also came with me today, um, she's going to have some videos when we have a little break um, that you guys can look at and see about um, the LIDAR system. Um, there's also on our website, neonink.org, there's a lot of good information on the about this and a lot of our other sampling too that I encourage you guys to look at. Anyways, what they do is they fly over a particular site and look and they can get certain variables such as can canopy chemistry. So what are, what's the chemistry of the trees uh, or the plants? The canopy moisture, how much moisture is coming off of the trees? Um, the leaf area, how many plants are actually there? Um, the structure of the canopy, how tall the canopy is, um, what land cover is actually there, and what is that land being used for? Diversity and also disturbance. I think the best thing I could think about disturbance would be, for instance, if there was a forest fire that came through here, they could then document that happened. <laughs> and I think the larger goal with this too is that there's this link between what we're doing with our terrestrial sampling, you know, with our small army, um, and then what they do when you know three people fly a plane. It's because they want what we do is we have biodiversity plots that we'll be working with, with our terrestrial sampling. So down here, any video by itself. Um, but then we can validate what we're doing down there with what they're seeing from the plane. So for instance, if we have uh, a, a canopy cover or um, a canopy chemistry, vegetation height, we can say, all right, on the ground, when we have a person out there, we're measuring things, we can say, this is what the truth is, or this is what our sample is. And then what is the plane measuring from that? And what that allows us to do then in the future is say, okay, so if we're really concerned about a particular area, like you were saying back there, you know, there's a certain area where we're interested in um, seeing, well, how is things potentially changing? We could fly the plane over, take a lot of measurements with a much less effort and get that data directly. So that's kind of the larger goal of this. Okay, so we're wrap getting closer to wrapping up here. So the timeline of this project. So I've kind of talked about we have this concept and design stage. We're currently getting sites built out. And then starting in 2017, we'll be starting our 30 years of data collection. Now, currently, where we're at um, in the observatory is that we have 27 towers built. Um, three of those are in Kansas, so that's pretty cool that we have actually a pretty high proportion of that already. 12 aquatic sites have been built out. We have none in Kansas so far, but they're, they're, they're starting to go. We have power run to King Street, for instance. Um, 13 terrestrial and 7 aquatic sites completed field sampling in 2014. And then here in Kansas, um, construction will be finishing up, and then sampling will begin um, at both Kanza and the University of Kansas um, starting in 2015. Most likely April or May is when we'll start our sampling. And then, our, like I said, our 30 year sampling clock begins when all sites are built and completed in 2017, and then we'll be collecting data up to 2046. All right, guys, so let's get, get back to home here. Where are our sites in the current? So we're sampling here on Kansa Prairie, which is where the majority of our sites are, uh, our, our sampling locations are. And then also over here at the University of Kansas Field Station, which is kind of northeast um, of Lawrence. So on Kansa itself, so like we said, we have the, the Kansa Core Tower, which is a little bit off of the nature trail um, <laughs> in that area. We have the Kings Creek Aquatic Site, which is kind of behind um, the shop area. I'm going to zoom in here. I can show you. We have the relocatable tower, which I'm sure everyone of you saw when you drove in today. Um, and then the McDowell Creek Aquatic Site <coughs> on the screen on site, which is again on the other side of the, the highway out there, down near the, do you call it area the Ashland Bottoms? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to make sure I got that right. Okay, so here's your concept for tower zoomed in. Um, so here is the tower itself. There is our power hut and where we're going to have a lot of our our um, instruments into, and then this is like what I was talking about before, that large <coughs> path that has our soil arrays coming off, where we will be sampling um, all of our soils. This out here actually, so if you, have anybody seen the little fences out there that look kind of fine? That's actually, it's called a deeper. It is for um, deflecting out wind um, so that we get an accurate measurement of precipitation. So when the, the rain comes down, there isn't wind whipping it all over the place um, and creating currents around our little um, collection. I think somebody else described it a few more times. said all it is is a glorified home bucket. Um, but that's pretty much it. It collects 
So here is just a little zoomed in of where the Kings Creek Aquatic Site is. I know it's a little bit difficult to see, but there's a small blue dot right in there. We're back in the trees on Kings Creek. Yeah, go ahead. What's the budget for all this? So right now we have a budget of $430 million to run the entire um, construction phase and then into operations. Hmm. Is that just for Kansas? No, no, no. The overall. <laughs> you had my hopes up there for a minute. <laughs> exactly. no, if that was the case, I should be getting paid a lot. <laughs> no, that's not. That's the entire observatory. So that's upwards of 500 employees um, and then 20 domains. So you can think about what Kansas is extracting. Yeah. Now might be a good time to say that we're looking for seasonal employees and they should get through. Oh, yeah. We are currently hiring seasonal employees. So if anyone's interested or has had experience with uh, <laughs> extensive biological sampling um, is full time um, all summer long, starting in April or May, March, April, May, and running through um, August, September, October. Um, all right, so here's Kanza itself, and here's an example of, and this is these are what we think where we're going to be sampling on Kanza. We haven't established all of our ponds out here, so we have a little bit to do. But these larger blue are our bird grids. So as far as we'll be doing. Um, point counts um, and sampling points on some of the grids. Um, we'll also be doing small mammal trapping, so you can see where our small mammal traps, those are the squares and kind of the magenta color. Um, we have tick grids, so we'll be sampling ticks. Um, we also have our base plots, which is where we'll be doing all of our plant sampling, our soil sampling, um, we'll be doing our ground beetle sampling. Um, and then these points here are our mosquito points, where we'll be sampling mosquitoes. Yeah. How, how are these plots selected? Yeah, that's a good question. So we wanted to, uh, across all of the sites, we randomly select plot locations. Um, and especially, it was really important here in Kanza because there's so many different management things going on that we needed to try to have, be sampling across that wide, wide spectrum. Um, so it's a statistical software package that I don't know how to do, um, but they did back in headquarters as far as looking at what the vegetation type is, um, what the proximity to roads are, and then also what previous research is going on in Kansa. So we want we avoided all previous research that's going on um, that is still ongoing. Um, and then that is it, it gave us a bunch of potential locations, and then um, the model allows us to say, okay, these locations are going to be more likely to be good for us as far as the vegetation type and location. And we go to those ones first. It is not. So that is a very interesting thing, and it's, no, that's a good thing to see. So we technically have two sites here on Kanza. We have one that is the Kanza core site, we call it. So this is a native prairie, um, so to get at uh, you know what things have happened been historically and what things are just continuing to do because it's undisturbed. That is a relocatable site, so just like the one that's at the University of Kansas Field Station, and that is looking specifically at the influence of land use changes, specifically in the So we will be establishing more plot locations for next fall um, for that egg area, but if you notice, there's the egg stick part right there, that's a little bit smaller than that. So it's considered a small site um, where we're gonna be trying to um, get some additional land area permitted um, on private landowners from around the area um, to especially areas that are located within egg fields to do the same kind of sampling on and look at the effects of whatever land um, use they're doing uh, with that area too. So that's a to be determined, but that's our third site. So remember I mentioned too that there's, most areas have three sites as far as terrestrial sampling goes. That's our third site, we have the Kansas Field Station. Kanza core is a large, and then the Kanza egg. What do these pots look like? Will we be able to see them through the trails or not? You know, it depends on if you're, you're, in, a, if you're in a yeah, if you're in a grazed area, you will probably not because we're gonna have our markers flush to the ground so that the cows and bison don't cut them. But on the outside of the grazed areas, what you'll see is um, there will be a center marker. Then there's gonna be outside that center marker a 20 meter by 20 meter grid, so we'll have points at each corner. And then nested outside of that, then there's a 40 by 40 meter. So what you would see in total is nine markers. The bars, yeah. So outside we'll have pieces of conduit that are spray painted fluorescent pink. And if you would get up close to them, they would say neon. Last couple is talking about project budgets. How many people have heard of project budgets before? Okay, tell your friends. 
Um, this is a pretty cool organization, um, or, or project that was going on. So it's a network of people, volunteers, across the United States who are monitoring plants across the seasons and to try to understand what is going on with the plants as far as when they're coming out, for instance, um, and, and when they're also sensing. So this is a group. Um, there's over, and it kind of got cut off here, but there's over 13,000 people who are currently involved with it. And of those 13,000 people, we've had 19,000 observations of particular plants. Um, it's a very neat project, both between NEON and then there's lots of other partnerships that we have going on. So the U.S. National Park Service, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Botanic Gardens are helping manage it with us. Um, it is, this is a snapshot of the website. So if you go to the website, it's a pretty easy way to get involved. You just register, you learn how to observe, so there's some short trainings on there, you select a plant. See what your favorite plant is that you'd like to go hiking around for instance. And you just say, all right, what's the first day that I observe it coming out? In the, in the, in, you know, as far as when it comes out in the, when it comes out in flowering, all sorts of things. Um, and then you report it. And as, I, as you might have seen in that previous slide, there's mobile access to it, there's, or there's online access. So if you have a smartphone, um, I think there's an app that goes along with that, so you can just go in and say, all right, today I saw this plant. Um, you can pick multiple plants if you want. Um, it's kind of, um, it, it's a, it gives a lot of flexibility and it's kind of a neat way to know that um, the data that you're collecting can be used in many things. So like I said, <coughs> that it can have a real scientific application, so a lot of people, scientists, are actually using this kind of data to see, okay, well, when are um, the cherry blossoms in Washington all right, well that was what I was going to leave it with as far as giving you guys kind of the opportunity to potentially get involved yourselves. Thank you, Jennifer.